So continuing our history of Western civilization and science, when last we left off, we were at the Scientific Revolution. So what comes shortly after that is Isaac Newton, who is often regarded as kind of the greatest scientist in history. Newton made a bunch of discoveries and accomplishments within physics, but more importantly, in fact, is his belief and his powerful argument that math and logic can describe the behavior of nature. You don't have to keep talking about supernatural processes if you're just talking about nature. So this idea is called natural law or materialism. This is a quote from T.C. Simpson. Progress of nature requires that no non-physical postulate ever be admitted in connection with the study of physical phenomena. Researcher who is seeking explanations must seek physical explanations only. In other words, if you want to describe nature, all you need is the natural. You don't need the supernatural. If you want to describe how things work, you can just look at how things work, figure it out, and everything's explainable by natural processes. Now, Isaac Newton saw no conflict with religion. So late in his career, he actually uh, spent a lot of time interpreting the Book of Revelations and conducting seances. So he was a man of many different interests. He's famous for being a physicist, but his biggest contribution to the history of science really is showing and demonstrating that you can study nature using natural processes. You don't have to keep talking about the supernatural or the religious. About 100 years later, we have Carl Linnaeus, a biologist. So Carl Linnaeus is the guy who classified all organisms. And he was doing this to try to understand the mind of God, right? He's religious. Um, most people are back then. And he's trying to figure out this scale of nature, right? He's still thinking about Aristotle's ladder. He's just trying to figure out like what that ladder looks like. Now, when he did his classification and he was naming things, he accidentally described evolutionary relationships, although he did not realize that's what he was doing at the time. He's the person who invented binomial nomenclature that you've probably memorized before, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. This idea that every species has a unique genus and species name, right? The binomial. But while he was doing this, it was very clear to Linnaeus that the species he was describing were the types or the molds that were invented or created by a creator, these platonic things, right? So these things that Plato talked about, he thought he was just figuring out what they were and naming them. And when he did see variation, right? So when he looked at animals and saw that, oh, within this species that he's named, there are individuals who are different sizes or maybe different shades or colors, he saw that as decay, right? That's noise caused by the imperfect world that's making it hard to see what the mold is, but it's just decay or noise. It's not important. So to Linnaeus, variation was actually a problem. It obscured identifying the types of the molds. So his attitude towards variation is very negative, in a sense. As the years go on, we're getting a little bit more recent here. Um, people start discovering fossils, right? They're looking at rocks and discovering what look like animals or plants. And when they start paying attention, they demonstrate apparent change, right? So fossils that are in deeper rocks don't look the same as fossils that are in higher rocks. And you don't have the exact same fossils in all the different types of rocks. So these fossils really look like things were changing over time. And so we have two famous geologists who have different interpretations of this. So Baron Georges Cuvier, when he looked at the fossils, he explained geologic change via catastrophism. So dramatic and sudden changes. These are also called saltational changes. And these dramatic and sudden changes that he perceived in the fossil record were due, in his mind, to supernaturally caused floods and disasters, right? So why do things change in the fossil record? Because there's a giant flood or a disaster that kills off all the stuff that was there before, and then a bunch of new stuff fills in. And this was attractive to a lot of people because it matches the geologic record to the Bible, right? The Bible has at least one big flood in it. Um, he would claim that there's just a few more the Bible doesn't mention that kind of explain these changes for fossils. This is in contrast to Sir Charles Lyell, who, when he looked at the fossil record, he explained geologic change via something called uniformitarianism. This is the idea that the changes that you see in the fossil record are actually not really sharp black and white changes, and that much of the change we see can be due to slow processes like the ones we currently see, like erosion. 
So you can go to a beach and you can see that you know, from year to year, maybe the beach is getting eroded a little bit. And then if you just have a lot of time, that erosion could add up to something that maybe looks like a catastrophe, but is in fact due to a slow gradual change. And in particular, Lyell, by using this type of logic, said you don't really need anything supernatural. You don't need these floods and disasters to cause change in the geologic record. You just need the same thing that you can see when you go down to the beach today happening for a long period of time. Now unfortunately, that did require there to be a lot more time than everybody thought was available. The world had to be much older than everybody in the 1700s and 1800s thought it was. He wrote an influential book in 1830 spelling out his ideas of human uniformitarianism. <laughs> all these people have different interests, so he believed in cyclical time and all sorts of other strange ideas, which made it a little bit harder to take him totally seriously. And he was very much not the sort of person who would stand up and argue for his ideas. So whereas Cuvier had a very kind of aggressive personality and would stand up and argue and participate in debates and really badger people into agreeing with him, Lyell was not able to do that sort of thing. So on sheer force of personality, Cuvier basically for a long period of time is winning this debate between these two. But this book is going to turn out to be important. Okay, so now we move the late 1700s to 1800s to Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. So Lamarck you have probably heard of. Um, so first he was a priest, then he became a soldier, and actually at the age of 17 was essentially declared a military hero. After he got back from the war, he became a bank clerk and then became a professor. So if you think your career trajectory is going to be strange, you could just imagine what people are doing in the 1800s. So Lamarck was the first person to come up with a real evolutionary theory, right? So he looked at nature, he was a professor, he's looking at a bunch of plants, and he wanted to explain this scale of nature, right? Aristotle's ladder. And he wasn't content just with them all being made on the ladder. He thought that maybe the ladder got that way through some process that happened over a period of time. And his process, or his idea, was that species don't go extinct. When you're looking at the fossil record, they change, they evolve, they evolve up the ladder because the environment is changing. So the way Mark would see the world is he would perceive a morphology ladder, right, like Aristotle's ladder. And on this axis we have time. And we're here in the present, right, so we're like looking at things now. And when we look at things now, we see, you know, really cool, very fancy things and really basic things, right, so like worms and slugs and stuff down here and like mammals and birds and stuff up here. And Lamarck's explanation would be they weren't all created like this, like Aristotle would think, but rather a long time ago there was an organism that was created and it's been like getting better and better over time as it's been evolving to keep up with the environment changing and because it's been around longer than everything else, it's now gotten to the top of the ladder. This thing started off more recently, but still a long time ago, so it's been changing for a long time, and so it's gotten kind of higher on the ladder. And then things that were created much more recently, they haven't been around long, so they're kind of still at the bottom of the ladder. So Lamarck comes up with an explanation for this ladder that everybody at the time agreed was the right way to think about nature, but not with a creation all at once, not with molds or ideals like Plato, rather with an evolutionary process, right? Things are changing over time to get to how they are today. Things are being spontaneously created as time goes on, but it's change over time that's creating this ladder. And this was revolutionary. This was the first person who really had a change over time model of why life is the way it is now. Now he often gets a bad rap because he also had this idea of use or disuse, that organisms during their lifetime, if they used a body part a lot, then their offspring would have a more evolved, a more developed version of that body part. Right? So like if giraffes stretch their necks uh, their whole life for food, their babies will have longer necks. It wasn't really his idea, it wasn't really original, but we kind of label him with it now. And since this isn't true, he gets labeled as the guy who got it wrong. But he was the first guy who really had an evolutionary theory of any kind, and that represents a bigger advance than any of the people before him. He was influential, um, he coined the terms biology and invertebrates, and kind of the importance of Lamarck can't really be understated in terms of a history of evolutionary biology.